Thank you for joining us today for our very last virtual learning opportunity in this COVID-19 series that the education program has been hosting. My name is Michelle Ekstrom and I'm the group director of the education program. And today we're gonna to end with a really important opportunity for professional development for you all on the topic of evidence-informed policymaking. We know that you have really important decisions ahead of you and we want to make sure that you have the tools that will help you be good consumers of information as you are looking for research, data, and other guiding information to make those important decisions. Today, uh, we have joining us two NCSL staff who are um, working on this topic in NCSL, so I'm delighted to have them join us. Before we get started, I would just like to remind everyone about the protocols for today's virtual meeting. First of all, please join us by video rather than by phone, and please be sure to turn on your camera. It makes for a more interactive experience, and we'd love to see your face. And um, be sure to add your full name to your title, both your first and last name and the organization that you are from, either the agency or the state or the um, organization that you represent. Please be sure to keep yourself on mute unless we ask you to unmute your lines and participate in discussion. You may also virtually raise your hand to be recognized today by, um, by me or by any of our speakers too, so feel free to use that tool. You can type your questions in the chat box and we'll be monitoring that and we'll be looking for information to, um, to ask our speakers. So be sure that you share your questions there or any information that you would like to share from your state. Please do not share your screen under any circumstances. Um, we will just ask that um, I share my screen and the moderator, or I'm sorry, our speakers share theirs. And just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and the archive as well as the slides or any additional resources will also be posted on NCSL's um, Education Virtual Meeting Series webpage as well as NCSL's YouTube channel. So let's get started. So today we have joining us um, two speakers, Christine Goodwin, who is a program director here at NCSL, and Iris Hens, who is a policy specialist here at NCSL. And they are going to talk with us about the work that they've been doing on this topic and share some tips and tools and, and um, make this as relevant as possible to the work that you're doing in education as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Christine, you can feel free to share yours at this point and we will get started. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, it, I'm pleased to be here and have an opportunity, excuse me, um, to join you all today to talk about evidence-informed policymaking and to share with you some of the exciting work that we're doing at NCSL in this area. So as Michelle said, my name is Christine Goodwin and I'm joined today by my colleague Iris Hinsey, who is going to walk you through a little bit later an interactive discussion that we have planned um, to help you kind of um, think through some of the questions that you can ask as a legislator or legislative staffer when someone claims that a program or a policy is evidence-based. So we know, uh, we've heard from uh, many folks that the term is used so broadly and is so ubiquitous and in some cases has become a bit of a buzzword um, to justify someone's position or someone's support for a specific program. So our goal today is to really try to break it down so that it becomes a little more meaningful for you and to put, explain what it is, uh, how you can access evidence, and then how you can use it to inform the decisions that you're making. So as we move along today, um, I'd ask you to think about what challenges you're facing in your state regarding um, finding the right type of evidence and um, how NCSL might be able to help. I'll be asking you a bit later for ideas. So if you kind of think about that through the conversation today, um, that, that would be very helpful. 
So I had the opportunity to sit in on uh, the Tuesday virtual meeting that Michelle and her team put together around state budget revenue shortfalls and the impacts due to COVID-19 on education. And if you haven't had an opportunity already to listen, I would highly recommend that you access that archive. Um, and we know that on top of the budget challenges that were really highlighted in that session, we know that you're also asking the tough questions about how education funding can support the best outcomes for students during this really difficult and unprecedented time. So we've heard from many legislators and staff, and this is probably not a surprise that if data-driven decision-making was important before 2020 hit, it sh it's even more um, important now as you navigate through and out of this crisis. So a couple of the themes we've heard from uh, members of a work group that we're working with, and I'll talk about that in a bit, is um, that data and evidence uh, can really help states get back on their feet faster. So while we're not really focusing on COVID-19 um, in this session, that's not the, the emphasis of, of this, it may help to know and kind of set the context that in this challenging environment that there are resources and tools that can help you make decisions about allocating resources and still promoting innovation in, in um, state programs and then assuring that state dollars are used to support programs that are most likely to achieve the outcomes that you want to achieve. So this is sort of a roadmap of where we're going today. We'll start out by talking about what is evidence-informed policymaking, why it matters. Um, then we're going to share some fresh new findings um, that we'll be publishing in um, very soon uh, related to the seven principles of evidence-informed policymaking. Uh, provide a few state examples to kind of flesh out what does that look like in states. And then I'll turn it over to my colleague Iris, who will walk you through an interactive discussion around a, a real life example. Um, and then we'll take a few minutes to talk about where NCSL is heading um, in this space. And then I'll turn to you to see how NCSL might be able to help you. So before we start, I wanted to hear, maybe I can get one or two volunteers to um, talk to me about your go-to sources of information. Where do you tend to find um, uh, evidence and data to help in inform the decisions that you're making? I've provided some um, examples of information here. All of these maybe don't qualify as evidence, but um, I just, just like to start off by kind of gathering some context about where you tend to get the information that you need. Okay, well, so what we're gonna be focusing on today is the second bullet around um, the research about a program or policy's effectiveness. Um, feel free if, if you just didn't have time to talk, you can also put it in the chat bar and we can um, talk about it um, throughout our discussion today. So what is evidence-informed policymaking? So we tend to talk about evidence-informed policymaking a little even more so than evidence-based policymaking um, to recognize that we know that policymakers make decisions based on a variety of information and factors. And we realize that using data and evidence is one important part of that. So evidence-informed policymaking really refers to using the best available evidence and data to inform decisions at all stages of the policy process. And you can see what those look like in this schematic at the right. It also um, helps, uh, refers to this process of sort of building information about what we know and building our knowledge to inform future decisions. And then finally, evidence-informed policymaking offers a framework and a set of tools that you can use to allocate resources to achieve the results that matter most. Gosh, this slide is a bit of a bear, I realize, um, but I'm adding it here just because these are some of the common terms you'll hear and that we'll even speak about today. Um, and realizing that um, this is a simplified, this is a simplified version um, and we can, if, you, if you're looking for additional information, we can provide, we can drill down on that as well. But I think the important point here is that correlational evidence tells you whether there's a relationship between a policy and an outcome, but not that the policy caused the outcome. 
Causal evidence, on the other hand, you've heard of, it can tell you whether an intervention, like a program or a policy, is likely to produce a specific outcome. So researchers often use randomized control trials or RCTs to demonstrate this causality. So I thought it might be helpful to sort of look at an example of what this might look like. So imagine that you're shown a study that looks at whether smaller class sizes improve test scores. So an observational study might look at differences in class size and then correlate those differences to the test scores, perhaps concluding that lower test size is associated with better student outcomes or better test scores. But there's a problem here. The problem is that there may be other variables or confounding factors that really get in the way and that kind of um, uh, come into play with this relationship. So is the difference in test scores really because of class size? Or are there other factors that go along with simply just being in a smaller class site, in a smaller classroom, or a whole host of other factors that might come into play? So in contrast, causal evidence is the strongest type of evidence because you can use it to predict a policy's outcome and a policy's impact on the people it serves. So randomized control trials, RCTs, are a research method that addresses the problem of other confounding variables by randomly assigning people to receive the intervention that we're interested in. So back to that class size example, an RCT could uh, randomly assign student, students to a classroom with say 30, 30 to a classroom and another classroom with 15. When it's done right, all of the other variables that could influence the, the test scores should be evenly distributed between the two groups. So this allows us to sort of isolate, to better isolate what the effect of the class size would be um, without the interference of those other variables. And that's why randomized control trials are generally thought to be more reliable than observational studies. And then finally, I have on here systematic reviews. Um, they draw from multiple experimental studies and not just one study. So because we see these results sort of playing out time and time again, it can help us know that a study's findings may, we might be able to generalize them and that similar results would appear if you replicated a program elsewhere. So that's a mouthful, but I think it sort of sets us up to talk about what we mean when we talk about the best available evidence. So as you know, and from your own experiences, not all information and evidence is created equally. And I'll just show you a couple of examples of ways of looking at it. So this pyramid looks complicated, but the point here is to show you that as you move up the pyramid, so from these kind of observational studies to RCTs and systematic reviews, the quality and the strength of the studies increase and so too can your confidence in them. So pyramids like these really prioritize evidence on a scale based on the rigor or the strength of the research design. Um, and it, it can really tell us whether an intervention can be expected to produce a specific outcome. So there are many ways to think about the tiers of evidence and you'll find examples in state and federal statutes. So this slide summarizes how the Every Student Succeeds Act or ESSA defines evidence as falling within four tiers. So the top three, those one, two, three, really requiring statistically significant um, effects on improving student outcomes. And then the fourth, for those models that hold promise, um, but maybe don't yet have the evidence that would qualify for the top three levels. ESSA ties certain federal funding to the use of proven approaches. Um, so that, that's another sort of uh, framework in, in, that can be uh, helpful to think about this. So where can you go to understand the evidence supporting a specific program? Um, clearinghouse databases can really help you understand what the research is, and I've listed a few of them here. For example, uh, one of them, the Results First Clearinghouse Database, has information on uh, over 3,000 programs in different policy areas, including education, health, criminal justice, and others. What's nice about this one is that it 
compiles or synthesizes evidence and research from nine national clearinghouses, and it assigns a color coding um, based on a program's effectiveness. So, for example, you could go into this database and filter or click on education and then um, I'll ask for all of those programs with the highest evidence of effectiveness and the database would generate a list of programs that meet that uh, meet that bar. So what does why does it matter. Why are we talking so much about classifications. Well, simply um, it's important because it can tell you how much confidence that you can have if you replicated a program or a policy, it would achieve a similar outcome to what the study found. So for lower quality evidence, we don't have much confidence that the outcomes will be replicated. However, with additional research, additional data collection, perhaps we might, we might be able to build, um, build that evidence and build our confidence. Um, and then conversely, for high quality evidence, we can have confidence that if we replicated a program in our state or in a locality, um, that the outcomes would be similar to what the studies found. It, Something, seems, uh, it looks like we got a question, uh, sure. someone on the call. Um, yeah. Lisa from Oregon asked, can you speak a bit about the equity issues that might affect evidence-based policymaking? I've seen some pushback against the use of evidence-based policymaking due to equity concerns. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that that is one of the um, complications. Of, it's one of the questions that legislators and legislative staff can ask when they're really digging into the evidence. What, what, are, the, what, what are the sort of equity dimensions? And so that's something that maybe we can also discuss a little bit later when we get into those questions. But it's a really important facet. Um, there are programs and policies that um, ha don't have a rigorous research base that affect uh, all, um, that affect different populations, and so there, there's sort of a, a host of constraints um, that we can uh, get into a little bit later too. It's a great question. Um, so something important to think about uh, when looking at these sort of um, uh, I guess frameworks is that looking at evidence in this way doesn't need to hinder innovation of new or promising programs. Um, we know that not every program or policy has rigorous evidence of effectiveness and that's okay. You don't want to squelch, you know, innovation if there's a new program or a model that shows promise that could address your state specific needs. But there are ways to um, uh, nudge those programs along so that they start to develop that research capacity. So that's why states, so I've, I've given an example of Colorado, look at evidence on a continuum. And something lacking uh, strong evidence today could really move up this continuum. Um, so with additional supports and new data and evaluation findings. So for models that are lower on the continuum, you may consider opportunities to invest in or move programs along the model so that the program can start to build that evidence base and demonstrate the impacts. So to sum this all up, um, why it matters, using evidence and data can help policymakers allocate resources to effective programs, to promote innovation by identifying those promising um, new and um, innovative models, and then by providing this kind of framework, this clear process for how decisions are made, it really offers uh, an opportunity to promote transparency and accountability um, in terms of how decisions are made. And then finally, by using data to identify bright spots and um, areas for improvement, evidence-informed policymaking can also help to promote this kind of culture of continuous learning and continuous improvement um, in how state government programs work. So now that I've talked about um, what evidence is and why it matters, I'd like to share some of our new insights about the fundamentals of evidence and what those principles are in states um, and what, what, can, what principles can support an evidence-informed approach. So we've been working closely with, uh, through the generous support of our funder, the Pew Charitable Trust, and a bipartisan cross-branch work group to do a couple of things. One of, the, one of the things this work group is helping us do is to define what the principles for evidence-informed policymaking are. I'm gonna go through those. 
Um, we're calling them the ABCs of evidence-informed policymaking. The, the group is also advising the NCSL on a new, uh, on a, the launch of a new center for evidence-informed policymaking. Gonna talk about that in a minute as well. So just a few background words on the principles. They focus on broad actions that states have taken to facilitate or sort of pave the way for an evidence-informed approach. So they're not specific to a, a, a specific policy domain. So they're not health or education related. They're really, they're really sort of um, cross topical areas. So all told, the group has helped us identify seven principles that support evidence-informed policymaking. And I'll list them here and I'll kind of highlight a couple in particular and then in a moment I'll provide some examples to flesh these out a little more. So the first example um, is around agreeing upon the standards and the terms used to describe evidence. So I've talked already about how evidence is defined and our work group members really pointed out that this is extremely important that developing common terminology promotes transparency and it reduces like confusion about how how we're speaking about evidence and then it also makes sure that stakeholders are really approaching the these kind of discussions and policy decisions from the same um, the same playbook and using the same lexicon so states have done they've defined terms through legislation or otherwise and typically what you see is that they prioritize high quality causal evidence that shows whether a policy will achieve its intended results. So that some of the stuff we just talked about. Another key step for many states is, is the, really the importance of building consensus across branches of government. So, um, you know, the, there's this um, very strong idea that implementing and sustaining evidence-informed practices over time really requires the buy-in and the collaboration of, uh, of folks across branches of government. So legislators, legislative staff, executive branch staff, and agency leaders and staff and other stakeholders. And states have found that really bringing people together can help to have these kind of big conversations about setting priorities and identifying the outcomes that states want, want to set for, you know, if it's in, in education or what, whatever those outcomes may be. Uh, third um, principle is around committing resources and staffing to using quality data and research. And we see that states have done, um, taken various steps to improve access to reliable data and they've promoted information and data sharing across agencies and then really started to develop staff capacity to analyze and then to distill information in a meaningful way for policymakers. Um, the fourth principle relates to directing resources to those programs and policies that have that evidence base that are backed by research and then encouraging promising ones to build um, to build their base. And so we kind of talked about that a bit ago with the Colorado continuum example. So some states have developed tiered grant programs, this evidence continuum that I just shared or other frameworks that may give preference to programs with strong evidence while also providing an opportunity uh, for new or untested programs to develop research that demonstrates their impact. Uh, the fifth one it relates to embedding evidence into state budget processes and decisions. Um, this is something we see happening in a lot of states. So um, there are examples where uh, states ask agencies to estimate or the, uh, the return on investment based on a program's costs and benefits. Um, we also see other states that require or encourage agencies to submit evidence-based budget forms. Uh, that may show how a proposed program can deliver pr proven outcomes. And I'll, show, I'll provide an example of that as well. And then the last are around fostering this culture of continued learning and then garnering support through clear communication and messaging. The, related to this last one, we've seen a lot of states have done some really interesting things um, around data visualization. Um, providing uh, agency report cards and dashboards that really help to capture and, and distill information clearly. 
And then just in, in kind of a sum, uh, one of the things that we've heard is that one of the key sort of lessons is that there are many ways of going about this. There's not one way, it's not all or nothing. And that um, the process is really a marathon and not a sprint, that change takes time. And so the, the idea of the principles will be that you can kind of look to see where there may be opportunities to integrate uh, data and evidence into your um, own decision making. So I pulled out a few examples. Um, uh, you'll see when, when the report comes out, I think we have maybe at least two dozen state examples, um, but I've just pulled out three very recent ones that kind of um, animate the principles that I talked about. Um, Mississippi is a great example of a state that's updated evidence terms in statute and so makes clear what we mean when we talk about evidence-based, research-based, promising, and other programs. Alabama is a great example of a state that recognized the importance of building consensus across government and established a commission on the evaluation of services. Um, something unique about this commission is that it recognized the importance of engaging the executive and legislative branch and both are um, represented on the commission and both co-lead um, the commission. So that's a really interesting example. Um, and then finally, New Mexico is a great example of a state that's worked to direct resources to evidence-based programs and policies. So it's their Senate Bill 58, I've got links here, um, specifies how much of funding requests, it requires agencies to specify how much of funding requests are for evidence-based programs. And then finally, um, the, I wanted to point out uh, the um, example from Mississippi, which is a great example of embedding evidence into budget decisions. So this is their uh, it's the seven elements of quality program design. And the framework, what I like about it, it really offers questions that policymakers can ask regarding a program's research base and a state's implementation or a program's implementation plan. So um, I'm gonna turn it over in a moment to Iris, but these are some of the types of questions that may be um, useful as a policymaker to ask when, when you're um, given a specific program um, to, to think about. And I don't see, um, and there may be an opportunity to, to sort of flesh this out and add the components of equity um, onto this list of questions. So before we move on, um, I'll stop here to ask if you have any questions or if you have any reactions to these ABCs, if anything is missing, or if you have examples from your own state that you would like to share. Please just feel free to unmute your lines and jump right in. Great. Well, reach out to me if anything comes to mind. Um, we are in the final uh, stages of putting together this um, this report, and um, I'd, I'd be delighted to learn learn more from from you all. So, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Iris, who's going to lead you through an interesting conversation about questions to ask. Iris. Great. Thanks, Christine. Um, so now I'm going to uh, walk everyone through an exercise that will hopefully help you vet claims that you may hear from your colleagues, from policymakers, or from others in the policymaking process when they say something is quote unquote evidence based. So the questions we'll be asking today are, how is evidence being defined? Is it causal or correlational? How strong is the evidence? Uh, what's the goal of the policy? And how will we know the policy works once we implement it? And I'll be asking you a couple of questions as we go through this exercise. So feel free to unmute your mic um, and shout out any answers as you have them, or you can type them into the chat box. And with that, I think I'm good for the next slide, Christine. And you all have been such a talkative group so far today. Um, <laughs> hopefully this isn't too painful for you. Um, so let's set up a scenario for this exercise. Um, ever since schools went remote last March, they have had to scramble and are doing the best they can to make sure they deliver an equitable quality education for their remote learners. 
In our scenario, let's say that you all sit on an education committee in your state's legislature. It could be in the House, it could be in the Senate, pick whichever chamber you like more. Your state's education agency has come to your committee with a request for funding or to reallocate existing funds to support a new grant program that will help school districts purchase technology as well as devices that will enable the continued transition to remote or blended learning. The agency wants you to vote on their proposal for funding. And part of the argument they offer to you includes the claim that evidence shows that investing more funding into remote learning technology will improve student learning outcomes in our state. So right away, are there any questions that come to mind when you hear this statement? As a member of your state's education committee, what do you wanna ask the agency about this claim? I'll go ahead and jump in. I would, I'm looking back on the slide because I found that slide helpful. And ha sorry, I'll go on camera so you can tell. Hi, my name is Emily. I work at the LAFC in New Mexico. This is my third week, so I'm super new. So feel free to give me feedback if this is not the right question. But the question that comes to my mind is what evidence exists to support this proposed approach? Because I think with everything being really new, I would be curious what evidence exists that this would be the right approach for improving student outcomes. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a great question and exactly kind of where we're headed um, with the rest of the questions we'd like to ask today. Um, does anyone else have any other questions that kind of immediately come to mind with the agency claiming that they um, have evidence to support this funding? This is Lisa in Oregon. I would ask which learning outcomes Yeah, that's, that is great. We definitely need to know not only kind of what the definition of evidence is that they're using, but also how do they intend to measure learning outcomes? And does that mean test scores or does that mean uh, engagement? What does that mean? Um, does anyone else have any other questions that they want to ask this agency off the top of their head? There is a comment in the chat box. There's a question. How will it be distributed statewide and does every district get the same amount or will there be criteria for distribution? Great, and I think I saw another question come up here. <laughs> what specific forms of remote learning technology are shown to improve student learning outcomes? Does the evidence account for disparities in the internet access? Um, what is the amount of improvement? 2% versus 20%? These are great questions. Great. Yeah, those are, those are all great questions. Thank you so much for sharing those and letting me kind of draw that out of you. Um, Christine, could you advance to the next slide? <laughs> um, so now let's get into how we might be able to apply some of the five questions that we talked about earlier as well as some of these questions that you all have shouted out, that the evidence shows investing more funding into remote learning technology will improve student learning outcomes. Um, so the first question that we really would want to ask or that we could ask the folks bringing this bill to us seems really obvious, but often gets overlooked in policy discussions. And that question is really just, what definition of evidence are they using? Um, our education agency is telling us that they have evidence, but from their claim, do we really know what they mean by that? It could just be, you know, their best friend told them this really like compelling anecdote and that <laughs> that's the evidence that um, is helping them bring this legislation forward. Or maybe they have lots of studies and they've kind of gone through and um, made sure that those studies match one another in terms of their, their outcomes. So it, it could definitely um, span a bunch of different types of things. So it's important to, to have the same definition of evidence to make sure everyone's talking about the same thing. Um, and it's also important to, to level set kind of at the beginning of considering um, a piece of legislation like this. The second question we might want to ask is, is the evidence causal or correlational? 
Um, so just a quick reminder from the uh, previous slides that Christine had, causal evidence tells us whether a policy did what it was supposed to and how good it was at doing that thing. While correlational evidence can only really tell us that a relationship exists between a policy and its outcomes, uh, but not necessarily what the strength is of that relationship. So with our example, the state education agency is telling us that allocating more funds to remote learning technology leads us to improve stu student learning outcomes. Um, we want to ask them, does the evidence really say that? Is there a proven causal relationship between spending more on remote learning technology and learning outcomes? Thanks, Christine. Uh, so next up, the third question we might want to ask our agency who is requesting more funding um, is how strong is the evidence that exists? If the evidence really does show that investing more money into remote learning technology is going to help students in your state, how many other states or even countries have tried implementing a similar policy and have gotten the same results? Um, the general rule is the more times the policy has been tried and has produced the same results, the more you can really rely on that evidence to say, hey, this might work in our state as well. Um, so now I'm going to put you all back on the spot. Do you have any examples that come to mind of policies that you saw working in other states that your state then borrowed from and implemented um, on its own? Iris, it might also be helpful to know if people have examples where folks have brought something forward and said this was evidence-based and really that they were kind of um, not uh, solid claims. That might be also interesting to, to hear. Going one, <laughs> going twice. Um, someone just put in the chat box, we're trying to get pharmacists to dispense hormonal birth control to increase access. Mm, interesting. I will say there are lots of examples of this <laughs> in education, but I think in lots of um, different policy areas where states borrow from each other and aren't really sure if the context will translate um, to their state, but, you know, try it anyway. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things we really um, come up against with evidence-informed policymaking is there can be examples or studies of something working in another state, but ultimately concerns about the specific context um, all, always come into play, for sure. Um, all right, well, the next question is another one that seems obvious and it was um, brought up before, which was great. But again, it has everything to do with the interpretation of certain words and making sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of definition. Um, so just like how we had to ask our education agency earlier about their definition of evidence, now we need to ask them about their definition of success. Um, they claimed that putting more funding towards remote learning technology would improve learning outcomes for students. Um, but do we really know what they mean by improved learning outcomes for students? Um, do you all have any thoughts that just come to mind on what could be considered improved learning outcomes? I'm thinking test scores, maybe also attendance, maybe graduation rates. Um, I, I'm definitely not an education policy specialist, but um, there are just so many different ways that they could be measuring um, those improved learning outcomes. Um, you can see that it's important to make sure that that definition is kind of sussed out as you're considering um, a policy like this. So finally, um, and ooh, I guess you want to, do you want to go back to the last slide again, Christine? Sorry about that. <laughs> Just on the last question. 
Uh, finally, you might want to ask the agency that's coming to you with a funding request if they've included or if they've thought about including specific measures or benchmarks to track its progress. Um, the agency is claiming that this policy is going to improve student learning outcomes. So how can you as a legislator sitting on the education committee make sure that if you vote to increase funding for remote learning technology, students really are better off for it. Um, and as a committee, we could definitely look at other state examples to see what measures they used. Um, but are there any other ways we could measure the success of a policy like this if we implemented it? Does anyone have any um, measure ideas? Um, just the last note here, concerns about equity and implementation and the impacts of a policy on different diverse groups in a state can really be addressed here by legislators and others crafting this policy. Um, they can make sure that measures are put in place alongside the policy to keep track of the equitability of outcomes. And you can go to the next slide, Christine. Perfect. Uh, so just to wrap up this exercise, we took this example from a recent meta-analysis of over 126 studies on education technology. The body of evidence that exists from all of these studies suggests that supplying computers and internet um, alone don't necessarily improve student learning outcomes in the K-12 setting. Um, while expanding access to technology does help improve computer skills, it doesn't necessarily lead to improved grades or improved test scores. Um, so as members of the education committee in our legislature, through this process, we've asked the agency requesting more funding, a number of key questions about their claim, and we now have a better picture of the evidence that does or doesn't exist to support their claim. So maybe knowing what we know now, we don't vote to allocate this funding uh, for our education agency and we decide to allocate it in a different way. Or maybe we run some amendments and come to a compromise with the agency agreeing to fund a certain amount of their request, um, but also maybe requiring them to fund something else. Um, maybe something where the evidence is a bit stronger at the same time. Um, so thank you all for your attention, for playing along. Um, and with that, this committee is adjourned. <laughs> thank you, Iris. And thank you everyone for your ideas. Um, so I'll just take a little bit of time to share what's new at NCSL and some steps that we're taking to launch a new center for evidence-informed policymaking. So um, this is something that we've been working with uh, this bipartisan work group over the last several months, so since December of 2019, um, to kind of uh, plan for, to identify what, what um, the mission and sort of the vision for the center is. And we're preparing to launch the center uh, later this summer in conjunction with the release of that report that I told you about. So we haven't named the center yet, but we are exploring ideas. Um, and I'll just say a few words about what you can expect. So we are working towards launching a center that will help policymakers implement the principles of evidence-informed policymaking. So, you know, we kind of outline these kind of broad principles, but when, when it comes to actually implementing them, there may be a need for technical assistance and consultation to help states. Um, NCSL will serve as a national resource and a training hub for state policymakers and staff. And then um, the, the kind of work that we always do, so raising awareness about evidence resources and how to use them um, to inform the decisions that you're making. And then finally, bridging research and policy making by convening. You know, NCSL does a lot of convening. So convening legislative and executive branch, academics, um, foundations, and other stakeholders. 
So ultimately, the goal of the center is to meet states where they are to improve the use of evidence in state policy decisions. Uh, we'll be working, um, so the, the center is, is general um, in terms of the policy focus. So just like the principles didn't um, relate specifically to education or health or criminal justice, um, but we'll be working across the organization to provide the best um, assistance to states. And uh, really to sort of based on where you want to go with it. Um, so, I asked you at the beginning uh, what, you know, what challenges you're facing and how NCSL might be able to help. You're familiar, I know, with the many ways that NCSL um, typically can help you in your states, including through uh, technical assistance and um, customized research and trainings and uh, resources and publications and our digital offerings, which you're all familiar with. But I wanted to just take a last few minutes to hear from you about whether there are specific topics or services or ideas that you have um, that would really help you in your state um, with some of the specific challenges that you are facing. So I'll, I'll open it up to see if you have ideas um, or, or if there are specific principles that you're especially interested in learning more about. We're definitely open and we're taking notes on on what would be helpful. So are there, is there any, anyone want to um, uh, provide some, some information about what would be helpful? One of the, as you're thinking, one of the things that we've heard from our uh, work group is that many states do a really great job of training, but that training is really important. And so, um, and that it's very kind of customized training is needed for, uh, there's one set, the sort of 101, and then there's a lot of you, I, I see, I recognize a lot of these names, maybe it's the 201 and 301. So really providing those kind of customized training resources to help uh, states kind of advance along their own um, evidence continuum. So I'm, so I'll, I'll give you my contact information at the end. If you think of ideas, please just pick up the phone and call. I'd love to talk to you to learn more. I'm including some of the resources that I touched on today. So both NCSL resources and then other select resources. Um, this is just a small, you know, this is barely scratching the surface, but I just included some of those kind of recent, um, very helpful resources that I think may be a good start. So finally, please don't hesitate to reach out to Iris or myself. If you have questions, um, you wanna track down any uh, additional information, or if you wanna sort of discuss how the center might be useful to the work that you're doing. And thanks to Michelle and the education team for carving out a little bit of time. I didn't realize this was your last virtual meeting. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to share the work that we're doing. Well, thank you for joining us. It was such a delight to have you both with us today. Um, I just think this is such an important topic and it's really um, key to the work that we've been doing at NCSL. So um, it is very much a conversation we want to continue and we are hoping to do additional work um, more in depth with all of you around this topic with Christine and Iris as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, this does conclude our virtual um, COVID-19 education um, series. We've now hosted 20 meetings for you. They all are archived on our website and are on our YouTube channel. So feel free to send the links to your colleagues if you think they might be helpful. Um, revisit them when you have information requests or these topics come up in your chambers. We'd love to think have you think of these as good resources. I might also also mention that at this point now we're starting to pivot to more in-depth um, topic oriented meetings. So for example, we have an early learning summit coming up. Um, we're going to be convening the higher education chairs monthly for a series of meetings. We're going to launch a partnership with ECS, a summer learning series for legislative staff, and we also have our traditional education chairs meeting that we are going to continue to hold just in a virtual format. 
and a whole host of other activities going on. So we will continue to engage you in this virtual platform as long as we need to and um, really appreciate your time and want to be here as a resource for you. So please reach out, let us know what you need, let us know if we can be a resource. And thank you all for your time and a big thank you to Iris and Christine. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Great, thanks, Michelle.